Hey guys, Nate Hale here with the Rapscallion Brigade. And tonight I thought we would take a look at the editorial from the January 2018 issue of Game Informer. And uh, the editor in chief, Andy McNamara, wrote this in, uh, in this latest issue that was released. And he mentions a few things that, that really uh, illustrate my my fears or my my worries about the future of uh, video games and I, I suppose I just need to come to terms with the fact that uh, most things are fleeting I mean really it's all just stuff and when you leave this earth you're not going to take it with you I know that uh, but I am a collector as much as a player maybe even more than a player uh, I spend more time collecting and and uh, organizing and curating my collection than I do playing games sometimes. And uh, one of the things that bothers me most about modern video games is that 20, 30 years from now, when, quote, retro, I guess, retro gamers from the future want to go back and play some of these, uh, they're not going to be able to. Um, Let's just get right into his editorial, and you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. He he mentions some things that uh, are going on here, and he looks at this issue from two perspectives. The first is how it affects gamers, and then he mentions, of course, since he's uh, working at the magazine, editor in chief at Game Informer, uh, he's concerned also with how it affects reviewers, and so uh, we might look at that as well. But I'm interested specifically in the first part of his editorial. He says, reviewing modern day games can be a circus. I remember a day when we got the cartridge months in advance of the game's release, and the game we played for review was essentially the same, that, uh, same game that consumers bought months later. There were no day one patches or microtransactions to judge. It's easy to long for those good old days. Yes, it is, Andy. Uh, I long for those good old days. I understand that uh, it's nice to be able to have games patched and fixed when they're broken. Uh, but that, that ability to do that has caused some developers to get lazy with their initial release and just patch it after the fact. And that causes some problems too, which we're going to talk about. But he says that uh, it's easy to long for those good old days, but the fact of the matter is, while those classics from the first three decades will stand the test of time, gaming today is the best it has ever been. Right now, gamers have more ways to play a greater variety of games than at any other time in history. And that's true when you take into account the, the huge variety in AAA games, and then you come on down to uh, all of the indie games that are being released and uh, smaller digital titles. We have VR, which obviously I'm, I'm obsessed with. And uh, it's true, that's true, that you, you have more games and better games right now than any other time. And besides that, we have the ability to go back and play all of our back catalogs of all of those retro uh, systems. But that's part of the problem moving forward. Uh, he says, however, this evolution has come with a price. In the modern era, publishers frequently ship broken games with giant day one patches and service outages. See, this is the problem. Uh, with my internet, if a game requires me to download the day one patch before I can even play it, I probably won't be playing it. Because my internet is so slow, it takes days and sometimes weeks to to download a file if it's if it's a big enough file and one of the things I really appreciate about the PlayStation 4 is that even if a game has a huge day one patch it will at least let me go ahead and play the single player game without updating even if there are some things that uh, uh, are fixed in the update if the game is playable start to finish I'll go ahead and play it and most times I finish the game before the update finishes downloading. And, uh, and so you can see why 
I in particular have a problem with huge downloads and day one patches. And uh, so you, you get down to it, one of these days, uh, those servers are not going to be there. And you are, you're not going to be able to get these, these patches. And it's, it's one of the reasons that I don't own an Xbox One. I would love to buy and play an Xbox One. There's a lot of games on that system that I'm interested in. I would love to have one. But because of my internet being as slow as it is, I literally cannot own an Xbox One. My internet is too slow for all of the updates. And, uh, and the fact that it requires a game to finish the update before you start. And that there are so many, so frequent, uh, are the updates to the, to the system itself. That uh, I would spend... 99% of my time just letting the system update um, because my internet is that slow. And so I do appreciate that about the PlayStation 4. But my problem with all this is that years from now, there's not going to be a retro uh, gaming scene because the games won't be able to be played. And I understand that everything in life is, is fleeting, but I'm a collector and... Uh, I'm probably as much or more of a collector than I am a game player. And so I like to have that physical media on the shelf. Not just to say that I have it on the shelf or in my library, but I like having something that I know that if I'm uh, alone and wrinkled 50 years from now, uh, I can pull that thing off the shelf and I can play it. Or my son can can enjoy some of those things when I begin to to show them to him and we can go back and play some of these games when when he gets old enough and uh, if a game requires a huge day one patch you're not going to be able to do that if it's a digital title that you've downloaded and uh, maybe that system uh, breaks down and you go back to get that game, you can't get it. You don't actually own that game. You just paid for access to it as long as the servers were up. And uh, there's no way for you to actually get that file and do with that file what you need to do. Uh, it's not yours. Uh, you're just paying for access to it. And that's one of my big problems with, with digital distribution is that you, you don't actually own it. And... Uh, one of the one of the things that's really killing it for me right now is all of these updates and huge day one patches. There are some games that require such large day one patches that I just I just don't play them because uh, I don't have time to wait uh, on that that download. Like I said, most games I finish before the initial update finishes downloading. So. Uh, so if it if it requires me to download uh, a 10 gig or 20 gig patch, um, I'm out because I just don't have the ability to do that. And so that that's one thing that bothers me about uh, modern gaming is that it it's not uh, it's not going to have the longevity that some of the retro systems had. Uh, I enjoy being able to take. Uh, Super Nintendo or an NES, uh, Genesis, all of those old systems. Now you get into the disc systems and obviously some of the CDs are going to have disc rot over the years. But Some of these cartridges, uh, even the ones that have been abused, we're not just talking about the ones that have been well taken care of. There's, It's getting to the point where we now have almost 40 year old games that uh, you can just drop in and, and play if you have the proper adapters or the right kind of television. And so uh, all of these old cartridge games, they're, they're just standing the test of time. And those systems with no moving parts, uh, they, just, uh, they just can't be, can't be touched in terms of uh, durability. And so uh, I, I appreciate that. Now, I am loving modern video games, no doubt about it. But... It bothers me to, to think of uh, trying to go back and play some of these games 
uh, 20 years from now or, or longer? Uh, what will the, quote, retro gaming scene look like uh, years from now when people are trying to, to run down the, the PS4s and, and Xbox Ones and trying to play these games? Um, are the companies thinking about these things? Are they, uh, are they thinking of ways that when their servers finally do go down, are, are the gamers going to have a way to, to back up their information? Or are we going to find a solution where if I buy a game digitally, I actually own the file and I can take that file and put it on an SD card and I can do whatever I want with that, that file? And uh, say like the Switch. I would love to be able to to buy a digital game on the Switch, put it on my SD card, and then uh, if I ever need to transfer it to another system or I need to update that system or that system breaks down and I need to get the files off of there, that I can just take my games that are on that SD card and store them somewhere else. And if I have to buy another switch down the road, I could take that same SD card, plop it in that switch, and there my games are. Uh, and I understand that, that that's probably not going to be doable because of the way uh, the piracy scene looks. And that just would open everything up to, to being pirated if you, if you were able to just... Uh, do with the file whatever you wanted uh, but the fact that these companies are trying to to make their their files as secure as possible then that uh, that hurts the the consumer that's paying for the file because now you now you don't even really own the game you're just paying for access to it now besides that uh, he mentions in his editorial about reviewers trying to review a game. And we don't have to go back through all of the things that went on with Star Wars Battlefront 2. Uh, but he, he brings up a good point about uh, what all of these patches and ongoing updates do to someone who's trying to just review a game, just so uh, not only the reviewer can do his job, but the readers can get a sense of what the game is like. So he says... Uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a fantastic example. Our reviewer, Andy Reiner, had to scrap his first review hours before it published due to changes EA made to the in-game economy. Then, within, day, within a day after we published the new review, Electronic Arts turned off all micro transactions due to public pressure, and we had to change the review again. He says, as I write this, we still don't know how microtransactions will eventually interact with the game once they're turned turn back on. Excuse me, Leaving reviewers and consumers with an incomplete understanding of the product. And of course he says he's not looking for sympathy for the game reviewer or for the direction games have gone. Change is always hard, but almost always a good thing. He just says publishers and developers are going to push the envelope of what we the gamers feel is fair. That's exactly what they're doing right now. They're pushing the envelope because uh, you think about what has happened. The the ability and the opportunity that the developers now have to fix things after the fact. Uh, it's it's a great thing to have to be able to put out a game and then somebody's find something that's wrong with it, and then you say, okay, no, no problem, we can patch that, we can send out an update, we can fix that problem. That's a great thing, that's a great ability to have as a developer, and it's convenient for the gamers as well, that you don't, if you bought a game and it's not as good as it could have been, that's okay, we can fix that. The problem is that developers, publishers are taking advantage of that, in that they release the product before it's finished or they release it broken and then they have already pre-planned a 10 or 20 gig day one patch, sometimes more. And uh, all they've done is press that disc before it was ready to go and then they're just going to patch in the rest of it. Well, that's that's not right. And not only is it not right for now, what's happened because of that practice is that years down the line, these games are going to be unplayable. And that's my problem. That's what really bothers me.
uh, as a as a collector. Uh, I just maybe I focus too much on this this kind of thing. What do you think? Do you think that I should just get over it and move on with the times? Do you think I should just uh, pack up and move somewhere where I have modern internet, where none of these things are an issue for me? Uh, or do you think that uh, all of these things are things that we should be discussing and thinking about uh, as far as collectors uh, in the future? Uh, are you a collector? How do you feel about this? What uh, what does your game library look like? Uh, do you have more digital titles than physical these days? Or are you like me and you have uh, a library of games in your house and uh, you're kind of clinging to the past? Uh, comment and, and, and let me know. Let's have a discussion about it. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me ramble on for so long about uh, about this particular issue. Like I said, reading this editorial just made me think of all these things that I have on my mind, and, and I think about them from time to time. I, I enjoy uh, modern gaming, and it, it's, uh, it's a great time to be a video gamer. But I think sometimes about uh, what are those collectors years down the line uh, going to have to deal with in trying to uh, find and preserve some of these games that we have being released today. And are we going to uh, are we going to be able to to have a retro scene twenty or thirty years from now? So uh, uh, just comment, and let me know. Let, like I said, let's talk about it. And I hope to bring you more videos again uh, real soon. Thank you for taking the time to be with me tonight.